welcome back everyone, it's me Matt, thank you so much for joining me on today's video. If you want to be notified of any upcoming content in the future, please feel free to click on that little bell by the subscribe button. We're talking about door gunners today, yes I know, many of you have probably aspired at some point or thought about being a door gunner, I personally have myself, it's a fantastic job, who wouldn't want to be sat on the side of a helicopter blasting away at targets with your heavy machine gun, light machine gun, or whatever machine gun that you may have available to you. At the same time, coordinating potentially with ground assets, being a winch operator. There's so many different duties that come with being a door gunner. And as you can see, these guys are having a blast of a time zeroing in and making sure their functions checks on these weapon systems are good to go. But there's a lot more to being a door gunner than you think. It's not about just spraying down targets in the fields uh, and, you know, flyby engagements things like that there's a lot of complexity when it comes to actually becoming a door gunner and you're probably wondering well matt why how how is that the case you know my thoughts of door gunners are more of scenes like this but the reality of the situation is that modern day aerial gunnery is a lot more complex than just an m60 blasting up targets in the battlefield uh when you're a door gunner in any form of aviation you have a lot of responsibility you're not just there to defend the aircraft uh, you're there to communicate with the pilots give them full situational awareness uh, you're there to coordinate the passengers equipment cargo that's going on board of the aircraft ensuring the maintenance of the aircraft is coordinated well with the ground crews of course yes engaging ground targets is a very prominent form of your job but also a very very difficult one. I have spoken to many people who have operated in this trade and I would say specific skill set because it is a skill set. Many of you probably are thinking well it's just pointing a machine gun roughly at a target and having enough rounds down to actually hit it. Not really. As you can see with this operator right now trying to use the M240 on the side of this helicopter here he's having some major issues right. There's some malfunctions going on inside of here Another part of your job is knowing exactly what to do with the ins and outs of every physical component and part of this machine gun, of whatever weapon system you're using at the time. It could be um, the GAO-16, it could be whatever weapon system that's out there that's on your helicopter. You are literally linked to this machine gun. Uh, it is everything to do with your trade and therefore you've got to know everything off by heart, pretty much dismantling it and putting it back together again off by heart, blindfolded almost. And the challenge when operating a machine gun like this is it's not like you're operating it on the ground where you have a lot more capability of getting access to it. It's a little difficult to play around with the malfunction of a machine gun when it's hanging nearly two feet out the side of an aircraft. Ammunition is also a concern, right? You don't have an unlimited supply of ammo to load onto these aircraft. Aircraft are inherently requiring a very light payload to take off onto an operation or a mission. So you being very inaccurate as a door gunner is not a good thing and hence why the challenging task of being a door gunner is actually the assessments and the gunnery taskings that you put on and that is the number one sort of pushback that i get from people who are in this trade saying if i don't get a certain number of hits or a certain uh, level of accuracy within a percentile of area i can actually fail a course and fail my recertification uh, to become an aerial gunner and the interesting part about being an aerial gunner or a door gunner is you have to recertify um, Now certain trades certain militaries around the world may have one standard training package You do it and then you're done, but because you're working in the aviation industry. There are some specific Quotas you have to meet for you to actually be operationally deployable uh, as a door gunner because again you are defending an, a very very important asset helicopters cost a lot of money helicopters are also inserting very critical assets such as special forces medics recovery of uh, injured soldiers things like that very crucial taskings and of course if you're not a do good door gunner they're not going to put you on that aircraft. And of course, there's a host of different training environments and different assessments that you're given. One of them is on the virtual reality world now. Yes, they're actually creating a very uh, sort of, I would say somewhat realistic uh, platform for you to play virtual reality as a door gunner because it costs, again, a lot of money to train door gunners. Just getting the aircraft in the air is thousands of thousands of dollars. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not as simple as just, you know, flying doing your doing your assessments and then coming home there has to be a real tangible uh and a prominent success rate for the door gunner so they put them in these vr systems to get you really proficient and that's why when i hear people say yeah i really want to be a door gunner 
okay, fantastic, but there's a lot more to it, as I said, than just pointing a machine gun at the wall. The, the assessment criteria is actually very, very tight. I know specifically in the Canadian Armed Forces, it's a very tight uh, criteria to be assessed and to be tested as an aerial door gunner. Because, again, as I said, it's cost, it's efficiency. If you're not good at what you're going to do, they're going to find someone else who's better at it. Uh, it's a very sought-after job, too. Competition is tight for this MOS, for people wanting to become door gunners. That is because, well, it's a <sighs> I would say it's a pretty cool job overall, but there's also the boring side of this job as well. Not every time when you go up a helicopter, you're going to be blasting rounds out the side of the helicopter. You're more so going to be observing for the pilots, coordinating load on and off the aircraft and passengers and equipment, uh, doing routine maintenance, routine support on the flight line and working with the ground crew. Uh, it's not all, you know, punching rounds downrange. And that's, I think, another thing that a lot of people... Uh, believe is just their primary function is just that door gunnery role and they sort of forget well actually I'm not gonna be doing gunnery every single every single day of my trade um, but let's be all very clear here it is a fantastically fun looking trade to be able to you know shoot targets from a moving helicopter um, what I always find rather interesting is the speed in which door gunnery is done at it's it's fairly consistent you know when you think of door gunnery and you, you're not used to seeing it, you think, oh, they're flying at, like, super high speeds, angle to the side, blasting away. Not always the case, you know? Sometimes it's a very slow engagement because they're about to do a touchdown, drop off uh, to pick up or collect troops on the ground, and that doesn't require speed, which allows you to aim that machine gun a little bit better. Ammunition depletion on this system can be very, very quick, right? If you're not conserving that ammunition and not know how to conserve that ammunition, you're going to be in a lot of problems, right? And as I said, ammunition... Although there's a lot of it on the aircraft, there's not enough for you to just go spray and cra pray crazy. Uh, and that's, again, a conversation I've had with the door gunners before, is they've said you would perceive as just having lots of ammunition, lots of, you know, capacity to shoot lots of ammunition because there's lots of room on there. It's not the truth, especially with 50 caliber machine gun. The heavier machine guns, uh, obviously the rounds are a lot heavier and bulkier to shoot, and therefore the aircraft can only take so much because the more ammo you put on the aircraft the less the ability for you are to pick up casualties, to carry other supplies, um, the armaments on the helicopter itself, right? They're not always just straight door gunners. They may have missiles on the side. They may have uh, extra fuel tanks. It all adds up. So again, the gunners that I've spoke to have said, you've got to be really, really good at your job. And the pilots also have to connect with you, right? You're working for the captains, the pilots in the front of these helicopters and uh, if you're not linking with them very well as a crew crew sort of member uh it doesn't go well either so you have to have that good vibe with the crew and i've have heard a horror story before of a you know a door gunner actually being kicked off a crew uh because his attitude and the way in which he worked with uh the pilots was just not there which is i'm not going to mention specifics but it's quite concerning right that you you have that dynamic where someone could be kicked off a crew because they're just not they're not doing their job correctly and as I said, this is this is a well sought after trade. People really, really want it. And if you're pissing off the pilots, so to speak, and you got a bad attitude and you think you know it all, uh, they're going to get you off the helicopter pretty darn quickly. Um, another real important aspect of this job is the medical side, right? A lot of people that I've spoke to that are in this trade are also confident and certified, almost paramedics, right? They have a huge amount of medical training because, again, in an aircraft team of a pilot co-pilot and potentially a couple of door gunners there's not always going to be uh, a medical uh, response team on board of the aircraft you may be that medical response team and that can be challenging right some people don't do well with the gore and the blood and you know the intensity of injuries that could be literally thrown upon a helicopter without that uh, intense medical care that you would expect uh, most of the time in situations where you know, a casualty has occurred, there is going to be emergency response uh, aircraft that will be designated with specific medics, but sometimes that's not always the case. You may have just done a supply run. You and your small crew of a couple of door gunners and pilot and co-pilot are coming back. You may be the closest asset in the area to get to that casualty with the ground force on the ground, and you are the one that, you know, is going to have to handle that casualty. It's not going to be the co-pilot. It's going to be you and your other door gunner, or maybe just you alone as a door gunner, dealing with that casualty as best you can you might get lucky you might get a ground med medic that would come with you but very unlikely myself in afghanistan when i saw uh, the emergency response helicopters coming in the ch-47s uh, the chinooks they had a whole team like they were like eight or nine people on board that were just dedicated like almost surgeons for the most part 
um, as, as medical technicians on the aircraft ready to go. But it's not always the case. You are going to be that person. And the amount of medical training um, that I've spoke to these people that are in the trade have been exposed to is incredible. I mean, they're almost paramedics. I mean, not, in all honesty, they are. They have so much medical training. Uh, so the gunnery is, is not always the focus, folks. And it's a challenging role. It is very, very hard. Um, and I've, I've talked to the same concept with JTAX, right? Um, JTAX is also a very challenging, difficult role. It's a lot of technicality. And people just think, oh, it's just, you know, using a radio and calling an aircraft. No, there's a lot more to it than that. I can attest as just a simple artillery forward observer in my own trade. It can get complicated, right? I'm nowhere near, anywhere near a JTAC at all. Um, I'd love to try to one day be one, but it's never going to happen because in Canada you have to recertify. And you're going to have to be full-time to be a JTAC, really, in, in the Canadian Army. And I can see almost identically the same kind of sort of pressures and uh, criteria and assessment uh, quota that you have to have as a door gunner must be insane and that pressure is probably pretty intense but it's also a rewarding job right think of what you're doing think of the responsibility you have uh the capability you have too right you can one minute be resupplying a fob that's running out of ammunition to then the next day pulling out casualties if necessary to the next day you know providing close air support to ground troops on the ground although it's a machine gun it can still provide a huge amount of suppressive fire on the ground i mean the amount of uh, rounds that are sprayed out of these machine guns is a lot higher rates than you would see on some other machine guns on the ground. The MT-40 you're seeing right now at cyclic rate or at gas setting is a set a little bit higher than some of the machine guns you would see uh, on the ground setting. Uh, the aircraft obviously has a lot of airflow running through it, especially with the barrel on the outside, so they cool down a little slightly less, uh, sorry, slightly more, my apologies, than some of the ground-based machine guns that, you know, are exposed to obviously the ambient temperatures on the ground. Uh, but you still got to be cautious, right? Overfiring this thing, you're going to overheat it and cause major issues. So again, it comes back down to learning that weapon system off by heart. But that's pretty cool, right? You are a master of a machine gun. Of course, heavy weapons debts, heavy weapons platoon sections have their own masters. You know, the, the staff sergeants or the sergeants or, you know, you know our, our regiments, master corporals, whatever, section commanders that are dedicated to heavy weapon systems and heavy weapon platforms. But even then, they may not be as more, you know, accustomed to the skill set required to lead onto a target. You know, when you're firing a machine gun out of a helicopter, the bullets are not going to land where the barrel is pointing, whereas similar to the ground, they would. Uh, you're looking at lead, you're looking at the amount of distance that you're flying from the target and estimating that distance, estimating that lead. That takes a lot of practice. I can tell you that first and foremost from uh, working with, uh, with the infantry in the past in Afghanistan. They've, they've talked about, you know, leading targets, things like that. Just from long distance with heavy machine guns on vehicles. I myself, when I was in the British Army with um, armored fighting vehicles, putting lead on, you know, your, your coaxial machine gun or your chain gun, that all comes into effect. And tracers are your best friend. They really are. And that's why these uh, machine guns are loaded out with a good heavy set of uh, tracers, especially, obviously, for night shooting. Even for day shooting, you're mostly looking for that spray on the ground, which is why another interesting uh, thing that I'd heard from some of the people I mentioned uh, that I've met in the past that have actually been door gunners have said it sucks doing door gunnery in the rain because in the rain the soil is thick and it's spongy right and it's absorbing the bullets in the dry dusty desert you see spray of dust all over the place so it's nice and easy to adjust but if it's a thick swampy horrible landmark uh, that you're shooting at it's difficult and, and that's a challenge and that's why tracer again is your best friend you're going to want to watch that tracer with the amount of distance you're flying around the speed and everything it, it makes it really really difficult so for those of you who are interested in becoming door gunners have a think about it you know think about more than just i'm just a guy pointing a machine gun out the window and maybe loading a few people there's a lot more to it that you know relationship with the crew uh your additional duties versus you know potentially being a medic a life-saving medic you could saving someone's lives or losing people's lives in in your hands right it's it's challenging stuff so don't look at it as one of those easy taskings this is a sought after job a lot of people want it if you're gonna do it you better be the best or they're probably gonna look for someone else so i'd love to hear your comments on door gunnery and what you think about it do you think you've got it what it takes to be a door gunner i personally don't think i do 
Uh, I'm not a medical guy. I never have been a medical guy. I don't think I'd be able to take a huge amount of medical responsibility personally. But what do you think? Do you think you have uh, what it takes to be a door gunner? Let me know in the comment section below. If you are a door gunner, hats off and respect to you. Thank you for your service and for supporting those around the world, including myself when I, I was in deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, massive shout out to you. You do a huge responsibility for us in the armed forces and the military around the world. And uh, if you did enjoy today's video, as I mentioned, you can either click the little bell by the subscribe button and click the little thumb button. It really does help the algorithm. Please click the like button and even leave me a comment. That would be great. Um, I'd also really appreciate uh, if you go check out my sponsorship brand, clothing brand that I'm being sponsored by, Attire for Effect. They're a clothing brand. Really cool stuff they got on their website. Check out the link description below. And finally, thank you to everyone who's been supporting me financially on Patreon, PayPal, and being members of my channel. It really does mean a lot to me. Hope you have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.